Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a podiatrist talking to a patient called Kimmy Potts. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Thank you for letting me know about your condition, Mrs. Potts. I've not had to remember so many details about my family in a while. Is there a reason why you wanted to know? So sorry. It's because there is one school of thought that intermittent claudication may have genetic causes, and I wanted to rule these out before we move on to the discussion of treatment. So wait, you think I have in inter intermittent... Claudication. But don't worry. The condition is manageable and treatable. And you think it's been passed down? Well, like I said to you, my mum's legs are absolutely fine, and I've never heard of my dad suffering from any cramps during the night. Is there anything else that could have caused this? There are a few causes, one of them being peripheral artery disease. Admittedly, it's a little premature in your case. All that means is there could be hardening of the arteries from accumulation of cholesterol plaques that form on the inner lining of the arteries. It may also be caused by a blockage in the artery, meaning that your calves cannot get enough blood. The cramps usually follow on and can be known as rest pain. It's usually the next stage. How long did you say that you've been feeling like this? A good long while now, maybe three months or so, maybe even longer. I didn't really think anything of it at first. I understand but I'd like to have my diagnosis confirmed with some tests, and I'd like to do that as soon as possible. That's fine. I'm more than happy to do that. What kind of tests will I need? You'll likely need a scan to work out where the thickening or blockage is. You'll also need an ABPI. Oh, wait. I think I've had one of those on the 13th of August. That's the one where they take images of the bones to see if there's anything that's broken, isn't it? Not quite. That was likely a routine x-ray. An ABPI is an ankle brachial pressure index to test the blood pressure differences from your upper limbs and lower limbs. Okay. What do I need to do for that? Can we have it done today? We can. But to start off with today, I'd like to test the circulation of your feet. This will involve me feeling for your pulses and using a Doppler machine to listen to them. This will let me know if they are monophasic, biphasic or triphasic, or in other words, have one, two or three audible sounds. Right. I'll then pass this on to the vascular team, and they can take it from there with all the other tests that need doing. Is that okay? Yes, I guess. I'm just a bit overwhelmed is all. One minute I'm absolutely fine going about my day as normal. The next minute I'm keeled over with pain that comes and goes as it pleases. Now you're telling me that I'll have to be strapped to machines and have pulses taken and Dopplers shaking. It's all a bit overwhelming, you know. I can understand that. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to go and see whoever I need to and have whatever tests that are necessary. It's just that I wasn't expecting this. I mean, I'm quite young, only 24, and I'm in excellent health. I've been eating a strict veggie diet for as long as I can remember, and I detox regularly. I wake up at 6 a.m. each morning so that I can do some exercise before work, and that includes Zumba and Pilates. Other than a short spell of diabetes in 06, I've never had any medical conditions or even any reason to go and see my GP until now. I understand. It's tough to take in, but understand that we're here for you, all of us, and I'm happy to book a review with you in two weeks to go over the test results with you. Don't worry, Mrs. Potts, really.
Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So tell me when this started. Started on Tuesday morning around 9 a.m. He started to get a few red patches right across his belly and a few sporadic on his legs. Okay. And um, has he been sick prior to that? He had it just a runny nose. Okay. Um, we went camping. So about Sunday morning he had a fever and he started his runny nose. And okay, so started with fever and runny nose yep. and then this rash appeared. Yep. On Tuesday. On Tuesday. Yep. And I know you were here in the office a couple days ago. Yep. And uh, they did some blood work and at that yep. point they were pretty sure this was a viral illness. Yep. Uh, and I remember talking to you on the phone that it was getting purplish. Right, right. And, um, and that was concerning because we know that can right. be bad. Right, bad exactly. So you had a fussy baby. Fussy and baby. Uh, this little fellow is only seven months old, yep. fussy with fever and then a purplish rash, yep. and you were absolutely right to call okay. because sometimes that can be meningococcus, and meningococcus is a bacterial infection that can kill you like in 24 hours, yeah, not good. and so I'm absolutely yeah. happy you called. Awesome. So a as we look at these purplish lesions, when I rub really hard with my finger, you can see they turn white turn normal skin color. The purple goes away momentarily and then it returns. Any rash that you can make blanch, so you can make it go away, that's okay. Especially, we'll take a look at this little guy's face here. Um, he's still, I mean, he's not super happy, but he's still pretty alert. And that's always a good sign. When you have that bad rash that doesn't blanch and a kid who's just, uh, this particular re reaction, because we were, we've evaluated this young fellow twice in two days, this has been progressive, and what's happening here is we've got bright red, pink, new rash that's actually warm to touch, if you look at this rash, and as that rash disappears, it leaves a bluish, <laughs> sort of almost a bruised looking purple rash, which you can see areas that are sort of purple. Oh, this, basically, this is hives. This is an allergic reaction to the virus. So what we have here is a viral infection and his body is mounting an immune response as well as an allergic response. And, and hives come and go. A classic hive lesion, you can see one on this shoulder where there's got a little central clearing. It's kind of a little more whitish in the middle and red around it. That's sort of a, an example of a target lesion that you see with hives. The key with hives is in general your child is not that ill. Now, he happens to be somewhat ill because of his viral illness and fever, so that's what makes this particular situation both confusing and very important to have it evaluated by somebody that can really make sure that you're, you're not missing that petechiae and purpura, the non-blanching rash that can be associated with meningococcus. What we're going to do for this, since we know it's hives, if you're at home and you have a hives-like reaction, maybe a mild one, you're going to use something like Claritin or Benadryl, mm -hmm. just those basic anti-hive, anti-allergy type medicines, and sometimes that's enough. In a more severe case like this, we're using prednisone. It's a stronger anti-inflammatory, mm -hmm. but you definitely would not want to be getting your hands on prednisone without having a doctor evaluate first, because prednisone can cause problems if you're giving it to a child who has a bad infection. Mm -hmm. So that's the key, that's why I wanted you to come absolutely. in. And thank you for doing that, yes, coming in. Absolutely. And uh, he's a trooper. Now, of course, you should know that prednisone can make you really grumpy. So if you get like beyond grumpy, <laughs> so some kids who are so irritable on prednisone that they want to be picked up. And as soon as you pick them up, they want to be put down. As soon as you put them down, they want to be picked up. If that scenario happens to where he's just more miserable than he was before, then just stop it. Okay. And this is going to run its course. 
because it's related to the viral illness, viral illnesses often run for seven to 10 days. Okay. Unfortunately, it's possible his hives could last for seven to 10 days. Or since we're on our fourth day yeah. or something like that. You know, the other main causes of allergic reactions, we think of medications. Uh, and then we think of certain foods like yep. peanuts and eggs and strawberries, yeah. but usually the peanuts is the top of the list or, or shellfish. Okay. If you have an allergic reaction to a food, and you stop that food, right. within two, three days it's gone. Interesting. So okay. even though he, I think he had strawberries a while ago, On Sunday. Yeah. you know, today is Thursdays. It would have gone away if it was just from that strawberry okay. that he had four days ago. So I'm, I'm fairly confident that this is hives related to his viral illness. So it would look just like this with a food allergy, possibly, but it would dissipate? Possibly. I, I haven't seen too many food allergies quite this severe. Okay. Uh, but, but that's the general idea, these red lesions with, yep. the, with the little uh, slightly raised. Hives are also irregular margins. They can kind of come and go. That's that's the, the real hallmark of hives also, is the coming and going. That is the end of part A, now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Question 25. You hear a trainee doctor discussing a patient diagnosis with a tutor. Now read the question. Let's have a quick chat about the diagnosis for Janine in Ward 2. Yeah, I, I was a bit unsure about that one. Um, because it's a young patient, it's quite... It's not going to be diverticulitis, or... Well, it's possible, but she is young, so... Yeah, it's unlikely. So, what do you think? What else could it be? What else happens in the bowel? Something common. Think about common things. Bilateral lower abdominal pain? Uh, because it's like radiating into the back? Yeah, something very much, much more common than that. Gastroenterological? Yeah. Um, I can't think. Possibly related to diet? Celiac disease? Perhaps, but there's not a lot of other symptoms pointing to that. What else would give you discomfort in the bowel? Lower abdominal pain. Oh, I suppose if they're just constipated. Right, yeah, constipation. Question 26. You hear a discussion between two doctors on agents used in vaccines. Now read the question. Doctor, what is an adjuvant and why are adjuvants added to vaccines? Well, an adjuvant is used in vaccines to create a stronger immune response in patients. Certain vaccines made from dead or weakened germs contain naturally obtained adjuvants and help the human body produce a strong protective immune response. 
These vaccines often must be made with adjuvants to ensure the body produces an immune response strong enough to protect the patient from the germ he or she is being vaccinated against. In the U.S., monophosphoryl lipid A and aluminum are used as adjuvants in the vaccines. Monophosphoryl lipid A has been used as an ingredient since 2009 in the vaccine called Cerverix. Aluminum salts or gels are used as ingredients in vaccines since 1930. However, most vaccines developed today include just small components of germs, such as their proteins, rather than the entire virus or bacteria. Question 27. You hear a discussion about possible causes of arthritis. Now read the question. Hello doctor, can you tell me what are the possible causes of arthritis? Osteoarthritis is associated with cartilage damage. Genetic conditions are thought to play a role in osteoarthritis. Age alone is no longer seen as the cause of osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease that develops as the immune system malfunctions and attacks the body's own tissues. Gout develops when excessive uric acid accumulates in the body and crystals are deposited in the joints. Reactive arthritis causes joints to become inflamed as a result of an infection that triggers the immune system. Usually, this condition resolves. Question 28. You hear the announcement of a new drug, Avastin used in colon cancer treatment. Now read the question. A milestone in cancer treatment. Cut, burn, and poison is the expression that describes the traditional three steps involved in the cancer treatment. Specifically, the expression means to cut out the growth of the cancer tumor, burn the carcinogenic cells with radiation, and poison those that remain with chemotherapy drugs. Interestingly, a young doctor from the U.S. proposed another method to treat cancer about 30 years ago. He thought that abandoning the blood supply to cancer tumors could block their growth, but many scientists dismissed this concept for a long period. However, last month, the Food and Drug Administration of the U.S. approved the drug called Avastin that works the way he proposed. Although the drug does not cure the cancer, it increases the lifespan of the patient with colon cancer. Avastin is a genetically engineered protein that connects with the protein in the human body that promotes the growth of the blood vessels. The protein, also known as vascular endothelial growth factor, intervenes with the supply of blood to cancer and starves the cancer cells. Avastin targets the weak places of cancer cells, though it does not damage normal tissue. Whereas chemotherapy kills cancer cells, and also the other normal cells resulting in infections along with stomach and intestinal problems. There are also other drugs being tested to investigate whether they can stop the formation of blood vessels. In the past two years, Avastin is one of three new drugs approved for colon cancer. Question 29. You hear a trainee nurse asking his senior colleague about the use of anti-embolism socks for a patient. Now read the question. I noticed that Mrs. Jones isn't wearing the usual anti-embolism socks, but I didn't want to ask her why not because she was asleep. 
Is it because her legs are swollen? Well, sometimes we don't recommend the socks if there's severe swelling with edema, but that's not the case here. Mrs Jones was actually given them initially on admission last night, but she told us this morning that her lower legs were feeling numb. She described it as having no feeling. Until we've checked out the reason for that, for example, it could be an underlying condition which could damage her arterial circulation. We're reducing the risk of thrombosis by pharmacological means. Oh, I see. Question 30. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse on different stages of gout. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different stages of gout? Well, there are various stages through which gout progresses. In the asymptomatic hyperuricemia stage, the person will elevated uric acid levels without any outward symptoms. The acute gout stage occurs when the uric crystals suddenly cause inflammation and intense pain. This condition is also called flare that can be triggered by alcohol and drug usage, stressful events, and due to cold weather. The intracritical gout is the period further urate crystals are being deposited in tissue. The main difference between gout and pseudogout is that the joints are irritated by calcium phosphate crystals instead of urate crystals. Chronic tophaceous gout is the most debilitating stage. Permanent damage might have occurred in the kidneys and joints. The patient can also develop tophi, big lumps of urate crystals in joints of the fingers. Pseudogout is the condition that is confused with gout. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the lecture given by a physician on the topic white blood cell disorders. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. White blood cells are predominantly involved in fighting infections and participating in inflammatory reactions, while red blood cells carry oxygen to the body. 
Platelets help stop bleeding. The normal number of white blood cell ranges from around 4 to 11 billion cells per liter. Newborn babies have a higher range from around 9 to 30 billion cells per liter, which goes down over the first two years of life and is similar to adult normal ranges for the rest of childhood. Opposed to red blood cells, the normal range is not affected by gender. However, it is affected by race. In national studies, African Americans have lower baseline white blood cell counts than Caucasians. There are several different ways to categorize white blood cell disorders. First, they can be categorized by cause, those that affect white blood cell production and other factors that affect the function of the white blood cell. Secondly, white blood cell disorders might be categorized by which type of white blood cell is affected. In some disorders, all the white blood cells are affected, but others only affect one type. There are five major types of white blood cells, neutrophils, which predominantly fight bacterial infections, lymphocytes, which predominantly fight viral infections, monocytes, which predominantly fight fungal infections, eosinophils, which predominantly fight parasitic infections and are involved in allergic reactions, and basophils, which are involved in inflammatory reactions. Thirdly, white blood cell disorders can be classified as benign or malignant. The majority of white blood cell disorders are benign. Generally, too much of one type of white blood cell is suffixed with philia on the end of the word, and too few of one type of white blood cell is suffixed with penia, which is applicable to all types of white blood cells. For instance, leukophilia is a white blood cell count above the normal range, and leukopenia is a white blood cell count below the normal range. These can also be applied scientific white blood cells, such as neutropenia, with too few neutrophils, or basophilia, with too many basophils. Leukophilia is an increased number of white blood cells. The most common causes are infection, medications like prednisone. Autoimmune neutropenia occurs when the body secretes antibodies that attack and destroy neutrophils. Patients with severe congenital neutropenia are born with severe neutropenia secondary to genetic mutation and have recurrent bacterial infections. Cyclic neutropenia is caused due to genetic mutation similar to severe congenital neutropenia. However, the neutropenia does not occur every day but in cycles of about 21 days. Leukemia is a cancerous white blood cells produced in the bone marrow. Chronic granulomatous disease is a disorder where multiple types of white blood cells become unable to function properly. It is an inherited condition and results in multiple infections, particularly pneumonia and abscesses. Leukocyte adhesion deficiency is a disorder where the white blood cells are unable to move areas of infection. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the monologue of Dr. Thaddeus Roxby giving a lecture on the types of eczema. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
Eczema is not a single health condition. It is a recognizable reaction method seen in a number of skin diseases. Atopic dermatitis is a common cause of eczema that is more prevalent in the patients with asthma and hay fever. The signs and symptoms of eczema include tiny blisters or vesicles that can weep and ooze, eventually producing crusted, thickened plaques of skin. It is always quite itchy. It is significant to distinguish the different causes of eczema, as the effective treatments will also differ. Eczema starts as red raised tiny blisters containing a clear fluid atop red elevated plaques and when these blisters break the affected skin starts to weep and ooze. In chronic eczema the blisters are less prominent and the skin is elevated, thickened, and scaling. There are about 11 distinct types of skin conditions that produce eczema. Atopic dermatitis tends to begin early in life with those with a predisposition to inhalant allergies, but it probably does not have an allergic basis. Characteristically, rashes occur on the cheeks, neck, elbow, and knee creases, and ankles. Irritant dermatitis occurs when the skin is repeatedly exposed to toxic substances or due to excessive washing. Allergic contact dermatitis occurs after repeated exposures to the same allergic substance. The immune recognition system becomes activated at the site of the next exposure and produces a dermatitis. Poison ivy allergy is a good example of allergic contact dermatitis. Stasis dermatitis commonly occurs on the swollen lower legs of patients who have poor blood circulation in the veins of the legs. Fungal infections can produce a pattern similar to many other types of eczema. However, the fungus can be visualized with a scraping under the microscope or grown in culture. Scabies is caused by an infestation by the human itch mite and produces a rash very similar to other forms of eczema. Pomphylix or dyshydriotic eczema is very common and affects the hands and occasionally the feet. By creating an itchy rash composed of tiny blisters on the sides of the fingers or toes and palms or soles. Lichen simplex chronicus produces thickened plaques of skin commonly found on the shins and neck. Numular eczema is a non-specific term for coin-shaped plaques of scaling skin most often on the lower legs of aged persons. In the xerotic eczema, the skin will crack and ooze due to excessive dryness. Sybaretic dermatitis produces a rash on the scalp, face, ears, and occasionally the mid-chest in adults. In infants, it produces a weepy, oozy rash behind the ears and are often quite extensive, involving the entire body. That is the end of part C you now have 2 minutes to check your answers.